Hello, welcome to our overview of the arts from the African continent. As you can see from our map, the continent of Africa is immense. It consists of over 50 different countries that speak over a thousand different languages, with a vast range of different climates across the various regions as well, from the expansive Sahara Desert in the north to the dense jungles of Central Africa and the grassy savanna in the south. Unfortunately, the study of African art is grossly underrepresented in the field of art history, resulting in a more fractured understanding of timelines and traditions than the arts of other locations we've seen so far. So we will look at works that represent major themes explored in the artworks and objects from a selection of cultures across the African continent. We will start with some generalities about the art from Africa. Spoken language has carried much more importance than written script in most African societies, and prominent religious beliefs and social traditions were passed down through oral traditions. Many of the objects we will examine were used as aids in the recounting of stories and beliefs, or used in worship and devotion to spirits, deities, and rulers. We will look at two important purposes and themes found across multiple cultures in the arts from Africa, portraits and power figures, as well as personal stories and symbolism. Portraits are some of the most prevalent subjects in African art, especially sculptures of terracotta, wood, and bronze. These portraits are often of heads or busts of royals, found often in shrines dedicated to leaders or around large palace complexes. Objects depicting the likenesses of rulers not only communicated their high status in different ways, but objects in the form of human heads and bodies also communicated important connections between people and the spirits and supernatural forces that influence life. These objects become invested with power from such a connection, just as much as they suggest power invested in other sources, from shamans to kings to invisible forces that can bring blessings or curses upon us. We will look at some representative examples of portraits and power figures from different African cultures and traditions. Though the communities around the village of Nok in Nigeria are known for their prolific work with metals, there is also evidence of a sophisticated tradition of sculpture made from terracotta. Historians believe these terracotta sculptures are the earliest examples of figurative sculpture found south of the Sahara Desert. Subjects for these sculptures include both people and animals, and the heads of the human figures are significantly larger in proportion to the parts of the body. These works were formed from coils of clay, molded into the preferred shape, then baked to hold its form. From what has been recovered since they were first rediscovered in the mid 20th century, human figures took on a variety of poses, including seated and standing postures. From the variety of poses and the unique features of each baked clay portion found, it is thought that these works were made individually without the assistance of standardized molds. With that being said, there are some shared features among many pieces found, such as the triangular shaped eyes and the holes that create the noses, mouths, eyes, and ears. Though we don't know the identity of this individual, it still appears to speak to us 2,000 years after it was created. The Enkizi Mangaka is known as a power figure, created in the region of Central Africa by the Congo peoples. These power figures are one of the most common types of artwork from this area and reflect a collaboration between skilled craftsmen and sculptors and religious authorities. Many objects like this in Kizi were created in the late 19th century and were associated with the Mangaka, an embodiment of the power of the law. 
As such, this figure represents the power of the political leader and the lawful authority he embodies. Everything about this figure communicates authority. He stands tall with his hands on his hips, as if ready to challenge or lord over another individual. The beard signals his age and seniority, and a cavity in his chest would have held herbs or other ingredients for medicinal purposes, giving him a healing energy or capacity as well. The pieces of metal driven like nails in the figure's torso are records of the lawful acts he has presided over in the community, emphasizing his role in conducting the community's affairs and encouraging others to respect his role and the law. Located in southern Nigeria, Benin was once a powerful city-state. The ruling dynasty over this important city-state dates back to the 14th century and boasts a flourishing royal court and dynastic tradition that spans hundreds of years. Altar shrines were dedicated to individual rulers of the Oba dynasty in Benin, and these shrines consisted of brass sculptures and carved tusks that were specifically arranged. Though most of these altars were destroyed in 1897, when both the British military and a fire ravaged the royal palace, they were restored in 1914 when the new ruling Oba commissioned the construction of an altar shrine dedicated to his father, the Oba king Ovon Ramwen who died in January 1914 after a long struggle to protect the independence of Benin against the encroachment of British political and economic activity. The altar shrine preserved the memory of the deceased king, affirming his importance in the social fabric and history of the community. Royal altars were constructed by the new kings in memory of their deceased fathers. These altars contained bells and small sculptures made of brass, a metal that was prized by the people of Benin, and contained carved elephant tusks placed atop sculptures of human heads, which symbolized the current king's dynastic predecessors and served as placeholders for the spirits of the royal ancestors. The brass bells are an essential part of an altar shrine, as they would be rung to alert the ancestors to the prayers and rituals of the descendants. This altar would have been the site of rituals to honor the memory of the former king and to maintain the connection between the world of the ancestors and the world of the living. In addition to portraits of specific individuals, or representations of particular types of individuals in African societies. Objects and various media have been produced to communicate important concepts about social relationships and human experiences. Rather than relying on realistic likenesses, many objects, as we have already seen, often rely on the viewer's ability to understand the symbolism within the subject matter and design choices made by artists. We will now look at a couple representative examples of how abstract and stylized techniques convey specific messages in the arts from Africa. This colorful textile is called kente, made from woven silk by the Asante peoples of Ghana in West Africa. This particular piece, called a wrapper, is designed to be worn by a man. Men and women wore different types of kente, and both the colors and patterns of the cloth communicated specific information about the wearer of the wrapper. For instance, the small lozenge design is called makoa, meaning little pepper, which would have been worn by minor chiefs. The colors all have specific meanings as well, signaling important qualities. Yellow represents something holy and precious, 
Gold represents royalty and wealth. Green represents growth and good health. And red represents strong political and spiritual feelings for the viewer. The process of wearing, excuse me, weaving this cloth is physically demanding and intellectually challenging as weavers use both hands and feet to operate the looms and must maneuver the machine and the many shuttles of thread in ways that demonstrate comprehension of the larger image and messages conveyed, as well as the small, precise alternating movements required to accomplish the desired image. Sometimes objects communicate messages about relationships as well as individuals. In this sculpture from the Dogon Society, the ideal relationship between man and woman is embodied by this couple. The male on the right and the female on the left are extremely similar, balancing this piece symmetrically. The main differences are in the anatomical features that identify them as their respective gender and sex as the male figure on the right gestures towards his genitalia with one hand, suggesting his role in producing children, and gestures towards the breast of the female figure with his arm embracing her and the other hand, suggesting her role in nurturing children. On their backs, which you unfortunately cannot see here, are small details that also accentuate their social roles to each other and their family. As the female figure carries a tiny baby on her back and the male figure carries a quiver, showing their shared responsibilities in their family unit. In the Dogon society, marriage was considered a partnership of equals and a shared responsibility, emphasizing the principles of balance and duality that stem from the philosophical and mythological beliefs in their community as well. Even though we do not know who these individuals are, they seem familiar, as if they stand in for every and any relationship in this culture. It is suggested that this object was likely made for funerary purposes, possibly placed next to the deceased person during a funeral or other end of life ceremony. This figure from the Banama peoples in modern day Mali would have been created for an important ceremony, an initiation rite for women entering the Guan, a society meant to aid women in conceiving and bearing children. During such ceremonies, sculptures such as this figure would have been on display, particularly those displaying a mother and child. Though it may be difficult for us to interpret the symbolism present in this figure, the qualities and status of the woman depicted would have been easily recognizable for a knowing audience in its original context. The hat she wears and the knife strapped to her left arm are actually symbols of hunting, usually reserved for men, suggesting her unusual skills. Even so, her maternal qualities are impossible to ignore as she holds a baby tightly to her torso, showing the importance of the connection she shares with her child. According to this figure, the role of being a mother was an essential one, not just for women, but also for the society, as mothers maintained social connections within the community and provided sustenance for life and future generations. We will conclude this brief overview with a look at one unique example of African architecture. Like many architectural structures in Africa, the example we will discuss is made out of perishable materials, such as wood and mud brick. As a result, there are a few surviving examples of ancient or medieval architecture in the African continent. But there are some examples of early modern buildings still remaining. As with the architecture we have seen in the ancient world and in the non-Western regions before this, 
African architecture has been used traditionally for religious purposes, demonstrating relationships between man and the natural world, and for political strength and connections to lineage and legitimacy. The Great Mosque of Dijene, Mali, is a spectacular example of mud brick architecture. The city of Dijene was founded over a thousand years ago and developed into an important cultural center with the adoption of the Islamic faith among the population in the 13th century. Not only is the mosque an essential place for religious worship in the community, but it is also an important cultural landmark. Although the mosque lightly dates back to the 13th century originally, when the first Muslim ruler took power, the iteration standing today is the third construction completed in 1907. Even though it is made of mud brick, it is an enormous complex symbolizing the enduring power of the local identity in Mali. The vertical pillars are topped with conical shapes meant to resemble ostrich eggs, which symbolize both fertility and purity in Mali. More than just symbolic and decorative, many of the features of the mosque are also practical, with openings along the roof allowing for ventilation within the interior space. Thanks to an annual resurfacing event called crepassage, the exterior of the mosque is well maintained. During this event, the entire population contributes, allowing each person to take ownership and pride in the preservation of this fantastic architectural monument. Everyone helps to create the plaster mixture, which is made from butter and clay found nearby. Then the men do the heavy lifting, mixing and applying the plaster, while the women traditionally provide water for it. Elders offer supervision from the sidelines, and children entertain themselves by playing nearby or possibly joining in with the musicians and singers there to entertain the workers. Thanks to these communal efforts, the strength and identity of the Great Mosque is continually preserved, emphasizing the role of connection and symbolism in the arts and architecture of the African continent. This concludes our brief overview of the arts from Africa.